Hello and welcome. My name is Amir Ali Alibhai. I'm the head of performing arts here at the Aga Khan Museum and welcome to another episode of At the Aga Khan Museum. This month our theme is Asian Heritage. It's Asian Heritage Month in May throughout Canada and uh, to try and capture that diversity, that vast continent in the scope of an hour is virtually impossible. So what we've attempted to do is to bring you some idea of the connections and the diversity of Asia. But, um, you know, there are thousands of languages spoken on this continent. And uh, the differences between different parts of Asia are as profound as between the East and the West, between Europe and Asia. And there have been exchanges between these cultures throughout time. Anyway, we, we start off with a musical work by the artist Hashil. I hope you enjoy it, and then we'll move on with some other segments. Enjoy. Hello. My name is Hashiel and it is an honor for me to perform for you a pocket performance presented by the Aga Khan Museum. Uh, today I will be doing rag Burya Kalyan. Uh, this is a, an early evening rag traditionally performed around sunset and the aro ovro or the scale is as follows. <laughs>
Now I would like to perform for you a ghazal, which is a traditional uh, form of poetry. This is performed originally by the wonderful Mehdi Hassan, who is a phenomenal singer and I, I really hope I do it justice. Uh, so please forgive me if I make any mistakes. Uh, this particular ghazal is in Rag Bhopali. Uh, there's only five notes in Rag Bhopali, the pentatonic scale. Sa Re Ga Pa Dha Sa Sa Dha Pa Dha Re Sa Hope you enjoy it. Good 
पहाड़ों से कह दिया एक चौदवी चांद ने तारों से कह दिया दुनिया किसी के प्यार में जन्नत से कम नहीं दुनिया किसी के प्यार में जन्नत से कम नहीं एक दिल रुबा है दिल में जो पूरो से कम शाही हुसन हो उसने जहान हो तुम बाद शाही हुसन हो उसने जहान हो जाने बपा हो रे मोहब्बत की शान हो हो रोहबत की शान हो जल वे तुम्हारे उसने की तारों से कम नहीं दुनिया किसी के प्यार में जन्नत से कम नहीं दुनिया किसी के प्यार में दुनिया किसी के प्यार में So if, if um, you're from South Asia, that would have been very familiar. And, uh, you know, the connection between South Asia and other parts of the world, especially East Asia, have been long time. And uh, the next couple of segments look at those connections across time and between different Asian cultures, uh, how they've influenced one another and how objects, artifacts, 
artwork aesthetics have been exchanged and, uh, and how this is expressed. So please enjoy the next two segments that focus on the interrelationships between different Asian cultures. Enjoy. Hi, and welcome to the Aga Khan Museum's Museum Without Walls and our Week of Beauty. Today we'll be looking at this viewer, which is just a fancy name for a picture, from our collection. In some ways it's a very plain object, but I admire it for its simplicity and elegance, and I've chosen to speak about it because it also has quite a backstory. You might be wondering why an object like this, with its plain white finish and unusual shape, is in this collection of Islamic art. If you're thinking it reminded you of luminous porcelains from China, you're on the right track. It is from China, but it's found in our galleries because it was later collected and engraved by a Muslim emperor named Shah Jahan. To find out more about this object, I got in touch with a colleague who could fill in on the Chinese and Tibetan origins for it, and together we'll talk about how and why it might have traveled to India in the 17th century. Hello, I'm Catherine Ann Paul, the Virginia and William M. Spencer III Curator of Asian Art at the Birmingham Museum of Art, coming, you from, coming to you from our virtual Chinese galleries. I love the background you have there. Uh, I'm Marika Sardar, I'm curator at the Aga Khan Museum and coming to you from a basement in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> While we like to think this ewer in our collection is very special, it's not totally unique. In fact, following centuries of trade between China and South Asia, we know of rulers in the region who are assembling rather large and impressive collections of Chinese wares from at least the 15th century. So by the time the Mughal emperors came to power in northern India in 1526, it was not only a custom to collect porcelain in the Persian cultural sphere that they had come out of, but it was also the custom in India where they came to rule. Mughal paintings from the 1500s on show how these objects were used at court. The example you're looking at now represents the celebrations at the birth of a prince and shows dishes heaped with all kinds of delicacies. Among these vessels, you can see examples of blue and white glazed porcelains from China. In a slightly later painting of a courtly gathering on the right here, we see a similar array of vessels laid out for a picnic. But in addition to being actually used, these porcelains had a symbolic function as well. In an imaginary scene showing all the rulers of the Mughal line seated together, there are two Chinese vases rather prominently displayed. They take on an additional meaning in this context because the painting as a whole is meant to impress you with the nobility of the Mughal family line, stretching all the way back to the famous conqueror Timur, who appears in the center of the image. Right in front of him, in the foreground, are objects that are meant to convey the wealth, the power, and the cultural aspirations of the Mughals. And isn't it interesting that the artist has chosen two Chinese vases to symbolize that? So these images show the general level of appreciation for, Mughal, uh, for Chinese porcelains at the Mughal court, but a special subset of them were inscribed, and it's to that subset which the Aga Khan Museum Ewer belongs. Here I'm showing the inscription on the thumb rest, which is a rather visible location, where it says Shah Jahan, son of Jahangir the emperor, and it also includes the date 1053 in the Muslim calendar, which converts to the year 1643 to 44 in the Christian calendar. Now this belongs to a larger group of objects, as I mentioned, with these inscriptions on them. But before we get into that, I've always been curious about this particular type of object and the shape of it, which to my eyes, coming from the sphere of Islamic art history is so unusual. Do you have any um, thoughts on that, Katie? This form is also unusual um, in a Chinese context because the silhouette of the very top, which is the monk's cap portion, is emulating um, a form that's taken from a silhouette of a Tibetan Buddhist hat. And if you look at the next slide, you see the Tibetans themselves created this form in metalwork where they called this top part 
a monk's cap pitcher. But interestingly, these vessels were largely used for ritual feasting or wealth ceremonies. They were not religious items. They were not used in religious rituals, generally speaking. The name of monk's hat is really about the form as opposed to the use and anything monastic. But if you go to the next slide, you can see from two examples um, now at the Birmingham Museum of Art, how there are these two flaps that come forward on the hat and that when seen in profile echo that shape on the top of the spigoted ewer. And the functionality of this particular piece, especially one made in Jingdezhen um, during the uh, uh, Yongle period, was really a diplomatic function. We know that it was really created as a diplomatic gift and that we find them in gift boxes um, still in Tibetan collections that examples like this are not only in the spectacular Aga Khan Museum, which has the only inscribed example, but of course also in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Harvard Art Museum, LACMA, the National Palace Museum, Taipei, and that's just in white porcelain. We also find these examples in other glazes. We find this form in other formats, such as cloisonne. Um, and we find some of these forms still with their original red and gold lacquer gift boxes. And so in some sense, this was a very trendy piece, um, especially in the 15th century, especially from the Yongle Emperor, um, even though we do find earlier and later, later examples of this form. So it's interesting to know that these are kind of a rare and unusual group um, in the Chinese sphere as well. Um, and so interesting to think about how something made for such a particular purpose in China might have then traveled over to India. But it's part of this larger group, as we keep saying, of things that were going between the two areas. And here we have just some of the examples from Shah Jahan's collection of objects from China. Um, so these examples that I'm showing now all have inscriptions on them and most have the same as one as on the Aga Khan example, but one on the bottom left includes uh, a title that he used which translates to the second lord of the conjunction. And this is another reference to being a descendant of Timur. So the objects chosen for inscription indicate that the Mughals appreciated the Chinese porcelains for many of the same reasons for which they were valued in China itself. These objects have a rare, simple beauty and have been executed with a technical perfection that we know the Mughal emperors were aware of. And these types were in circulation in a much wider sphere as well, as we can see from these examples. So these two um, darker color dishes in the upper and lower corners are actually made in Vietnam, but you can see that the motifs that you find in Vietnam are very similar to the Chinese example that then found its way into the Mughal court. And there's a wonderful uh, Polish scholar, Amelia Maczyzek, who's been studying specifically how um, Persian uh, Persian understanding of these motifs overlap and yet differentiate themselves from East Asian understanding of the very same motif. So looking at the deer motif in the lower corner um, would be read differently through a Safavid or a Persian eye or a Mughal eye than it would be read from a, a, an East Asian perspective, as would the Qi Lin. So there's some very interesting um, multi-layered conversations even with the very same motif much less um, also interesting conversations in the multiple points of ports that were making these kinds of blue and white ceramic pieces both domestic consumption for international trade in the 15th and 16th centuries. Interesting as well to look at the variety of Chinese objects that traveled and you know speaking to that Mughal appreciation for, for different types of objects. It wasn't just um, the blue and white, which are very much, you know, in a way easier to appreciate. But um, it's important to note that they took an interest in, you know, the very understated white glaze objects, like the one in the Aga Khan Museum, or this celadon with a very subtly incised design, 
for which there's almost no counterpart in the Islamic world, um, except for imitations, of course. And this example, now in a museum in Doha, is inscribed with the name of Suleiman Shiko, grandson of Shah Jahan. One last point I wanted to make is that the Mughals weren't just buying newly made objects of high quality, but they are seeking out very special objects made centuries earlier that must have been in prized collections from the time that they were made. And to that point, one of the examples from Shah Jahan's collection actually has an inscription on it saying that it belonged at one point to Mahin Banu, a princess of the Safavid dynasty, who then donated it to a shrine in Mashhad, Iran. And from those Ill illustrious collections, it found its way to Shah Jahan. And all of these things were adding, playing into the value it would have had at the Mughal court. Thank you for bringing us back to this stunning object that we started off with. We really roamed far and wide from this uh, starting point. Um, but it's been so interesting to see how you approach this object with the range of objects, um, you know, in your mind from all over Asia, Southeast Asia, and so on, um, that respond to these Chinese exports. And to me, that really um, also speaks to the theme of our week of, of beauty and what, you know, how um, sort of the simple elegance and grace of an object can transcend all these cultural differences and something like this can be appreciated from uh, so many different peoples. My name is Jane Liu. I'm a museum goer. I love museum and the gallery, where are always my main destination whenever I travel. I enjoy gazing at the objects on display and contemplate. Here I am at Aldaka Museum in Toronto. When entering in the permanent gallery, a blowed up image on the wall of the court of Akayomas welcome me. I can hardly move my eyes away from it. My gaze will starting from the center, then move gradually to the left, clockwise through the top. All of a sudden, those colorful clouds draw my attention immediately. I told myself, I knew that motif Hmm, from my Chinese background. The composition of this image is very much like the Chinese landscape painting in the vertical format. However, I seldom see Chinese painter depiction cloud as those cloud. Nevertheless, why those clouds are so familiar? I must uh, see, some, see them somewhere. I search deep in my mind. Oh yes, lacquer box. This one. This is my friend gave it to me as modern copy lacquer box some years ago. You see the curved cloud motif carved on the side panel. Chinese are fond of auspicious symbol and the cloud is one of them. We like very much to have those symbols on us all the time. A brooch, a pendant, or even like this. Show with the so-called Ru Yi cloud. Ru Yi, literature meaning is as you wish. Those cloud actually is more like those cloud on the court of the Kayomas, uh, without doubt, Ru Yi cloud which you can see on the screen. 
how amazing seeing those traditional Chinese auspicious motif being depicted on Islamic manuscript. Wonder would those auspicious cloud under Islamic artist brush, they will carry the similar auspicious, auspicious meaning. I told myself before spending more time to dig it out. So let me firstly separate myself from any analysis that can come later. But in this moment, is to simple experience the impact of looking. You see those clouds, things hung over the mountain without any motion. Or if you look closely from the form of the shape of the cloud, look like they are moving, but very slow from the right toward the left. A 12th century Chinese poem comes to my mind. 我看满天云不动,不知云与我俱动. Allow me to translate. I'm lying down watching the lotus cloud hanging motionless in the sky. Could those cloud will move with me toward the east? When I'm feeling down, I just simply look up to the sky. That is what I like about coming to the museum, gazing at each object on display. Find out the connection between cultures. Amazing how cultural interaction happened through history. Thank you for joining me. Well, I hope you found that informative. I know that I was really fascinated by what Jane had to say about the clouds and, you know, their, their uh, connection to Chinese painting. And, uh, of course, that ceramic piece that's in our permanent collection that was collected by Shah Jahan, the builder of the Taj Mahal, and uh, also a collector of Ming porcelain. I thought that's a fascinating story. And I love looking at that object whenever I have the opportunity uh, to visit the permanent collection galleries. And hopefully um, I'll get a chance to do that again soon. And so will you. Our last segment, uh, we go from where we began in Northern India with Hashil. And uh, we are going to end with a musical segment a performance on pipa, which is a traditional court uh, musical instrument from uh, the Han court uh, in China. And the pipa has been played for centuries, if not millennia. And um, it's a beautiful instrument and it's played by master virtuoso on the pipa, Wen Zhao, who lives in Toronto. And we've had the good fortune of working with many times over the years. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy this this uh, final segment uh, with Wen Zhao. Thanks. traditional instrument, Chinese instrument. And the history about this instrument is over 2,000 years. Um, I have four strings here. Four strings. Originally, the string made of silk, so a silk string pipa in, in the old days. Uh, but uh, the modern pipa now is people change to nylon string or metal string. So, uh, there's all the frets here. Of course, it's a string instrument. And you will see my right hand at five uh, fingernails to play the technique. Um, the most important technique, um, um, you see my uh, later on performance, uh, I use five fingers to make a continual roll. So this is how I play. So 
this is the pi pa. Pi is your fingering play forward. Pa is your play backwards. So th this is how we name the instrument. Pi and pa. Pi play forward. Pa is backward. Pi. Now I'm ready to give a little performance today, live performance at home, and uh, the I want to demonstrate our tra tra Chinese traditional music here. Uh, I'm starting with uh, two pieces uh, from southern China, is from Qing Dynasty, um, which is a uh, folk tone uh, from the village. Of course, all the beautiful uh, pictures of the village, village you could see. A very bright moon in, in the night time and then in the morning time all the birds singing that's the music of art.
piece is called Dragon Boat. I always perform this uh, concept as very challenge, but it's lovely. It just uh, celebrate all our Dragon Boat Festival in China.
Well, that's our show. This episode is done. And uh, if you want to see more, check out our YouTube channel or go to www.agakanmuseum.org and uh, search Museum Without Walls to see a lot more content uh, and uh, to learn even more about Asia because it's very well represented in our content that's online. Enjoy uh, your month and happy Ramadan because that has begun as well. Take care, everyone.